Hi hey everyone. Today we're going to take a look at post-impressionism. And just as kind of a quick review, uh, we're going to go through some basic impressionist works and the ideas behind it first. Um, lots of images over the course of the next two days and a lot of information is going to come from Khan Academy. So thanks to those guys, they put out incredible stuff. Again, the official AP and SAT review site at Khan Academy. Uh, impressionism. Short, quick brushstrokes, avoiding the color black as uh, just as it is, but the color black is used to emphasize things. Um, vivid colors that don't necessarily mix so that you create a nice, um, bright contrast between them as opposed to a blending of colors. Uh, use of natural light. Many of these painters are going to work outside to get some of that natural light into their uh, artwork. Uh, breaking the rules. Emphasizing color over specific lines. So breaking away from trying to create the sharp lines of what would be an actual image. I remember that this, in some cases, Impressionism, is uh, kind of a rebuke of uh, what had been done prior, trying to create exactly an exact replica of what exactly is going on, because the photograph is going to kind of take that aspect away. And so the painters are going to move in the opposite direction and start to create more of what their personal, quote unquote, impression uh, or um, what they see for a particular fleeting moment is going to look like. Uh, Monet is going to be kind of the um, father of uh, Impressionism. That's how it gets its name. This is Impressionism Sunrise, 1872. You can take a look at those brush strokes that are in there. It's not necessarily trying to exactly recreate or replicate a particular scene, um, but you can feel the emotion of the artist kind of working through this, and you're trying to get a feeling of what the artist was feeling at that particular uh, here, as we move into post-impressionists, is Cezanne. Cezanne is from the Impressionist school, but he starts to move away, and we see some of these early pieces of post-impressionism come to pass. We see the playing of angles. We see the playing of um, form. The, the statue is a little bit stretched out. It's not trying to perfectly replicate anything. Colors are used, yes, as you see them amongst these fruit, but they're again, they're meant to create sharp contrast. In addition, uh, Cezanne is playing with the viewer's angle of, of, of viewership here. You don't see a horizon necessarily. You don't see an end. You can't really tell where things end or begin. It's just one particular aspect of a, a scene itself. You see the angle of the table. Are things rolling away or are they standing still? It's kind of playing with the way that you would view a particular work. For post-impressionism, we have a variety of movements that kind of contribute to it. Uh, first one we're going to take a look at is pointillism, which is more of a technique than anything else. Uh, then we'll see fauvism and cubism make their way into these post-impressionist works as well. A Sunday on La Grande Jatte, this is Georges Seurat, uh, 1884. Um, this is using pointillism, and if you were to zoom in, you would see lots of little tiny dots representing the brush strokes here. So these are not full fluid brush strokes, but instead, um, these various colors are created by positioning different colors next to each other. So, for example, if you look at the purple of this particular woman's dress, it's not done by creating um, a mixture of red and blue. Instead, those colors are placed next to each other, and your eyes are naturally going to see the color in between. And, and so they're going to use those dots. These artists are going to use those dots in pointillism to uh, give us those different colors. Um, notice here we do have um, a little bit different than in Impressionism. You do see the sharpness of lines for a lot of these people. But again, it's not trying to replicate something exact. Um, if you look at the faces uh, and the, the bodies of these people, they're not exactly trying to replicate what you would actually see. It's giving us a window into what uh, George Seurat saw. Uh, we still see the use of natural light. You can see the way that the shadows play over things here. Um, on this particular like beachy, picnic-y type area. Uh, this painting made famous by Ferris Bueller's Day Off. You may have been wondering, hey, I've seen that before. That's, uh, that's the one that Cameron's looking at right there. Another example of post-impressionism um, is The Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh. Uh, this is, he's the Dutch artist. Yes, he's the ear guy who supposedly cut off his ear and uh, as a symbol of his dedication and blah, blah, blah. Um, but if you take a look, we see something similar with the brush strokes. We see short, jagged brush strokes as you look across the sky, but um, those colors are separate from each other and it's forcing your eyes to, to kind of see a swirling nature to things, even though the colors aren't necessarily mixing together as you look through. 
um, painted a variety of these. Uh, it's actually very small, as you see the perspective here. Um, it's not a very large work. It, it's kind of one of those canon uh, works that, that you see all over the place, that Starry Night is kind of one you should know. Uh, he is a Van Gogh, is a, a, a post-impressionist. And the technique that you're looking at here, the impasto, um, the Khan Academy videos, I can't recommend them enough, do a great job of kind of explaining that technique and how that technique manifests itself in these different famous works. Uh, Bonheur de Vivre, again, my French is awesome. Uh, this is Henri Matisse, and so now we are moving into, um, even further into Fauvism here, the playing with colors. These colors do not represent the actual subject matter of the painting. However, these colors are uh, meant to be played with, meant to be completely playful. And yes, we see some different shading and things like that, but um, ultimately the colors are there to be manipulated, not to create a sense of reality in any way. Le Demoiselles d'Avignon, this is Pablo Picasso. This is um, considered by some to be the first cubist work. And if we look at the shapes of the bodies of these women, this is depicting women in a brothel, um, but it's doing so in a way that has not been done before. Um, we talked a lot about how in the late 1800s and early 1900s, um, we see uh, some women who are, can't get to those white collar jobs um, turn to prostitution. And so this is kind of a, a normalizing of that particular profession. And so we see these women here depicted. Notice that the, the body shapes are not done to what we would think of as a traditional nude work by an artist, by like a Renaissance artist. Um, the lines are sharper, they're more jagged. They, um, he plays with the faces. Um, Picasso at this point is gonna be influenced by seeing West African masks. And so he ties that and pulls that in. You have a bunch of different um, styles and techniques being used all at once by Picasso here. And if you look in the background, the way that the sheet is, um, it's not elegantly draped across people. It's kind of jagged and rough and juts in and out of um, the different places that you see it. And that's going to be a, something that we see a lot of, um, the, the shapes that we see in um, cubism as we move through that. Uh, what you're going to see here is a short video clip on that, and um, uh, the Khan Academy people are going to go through there. You can watch that on your own. Uh, then we get to Pablo Picasso later work by him. Uh, this is called Guernica. This is 1937, so we have passed through World War I, and we are in the interwar period. And you see the elements of that drapery from the previous work um, really kind of shining through here. Um, at first, when you look at this, it looks chaotic. It looks jumbled. Um, the story behind this work is almost more important than the work itself. Picasso was influenced politically by the Spanish Civil War that we had talked about briefly, or your textbook talked about in the last chapter. Um, this Spanish Civil War, um, the group uh, of Francisco Franco, a general, a generalissimo, uh, is going to be bombing a basically an urban village that has ties to this more centrist government. And this is like a trial run for um, the fascists of Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini, two um, kind of allies of Francisco Franco. And uh, it kind of foreshadows the way that the bombing is going to go in World War II, that cities are not safe, that everything is fair game. Uh, it shows the utter destruction of the town of Guernica itself um, in the Basque region in Spain northern Spain. And you can see kind of the, the pain on the people's faces as they're depicted, uh, heads and limbs separated. Um, this painting is, is moving us more into an abstract realm than ever before. Uh, and so uh, Pablo Picasso definitely is, is one of those heavy hitters for post-impressionist work. Uh, it's based on this event over here, historic Basque town wiped out. Uh, and you can see that here, people who tried to flee as the bombing took place, destroying over 70% of the city, uh, were strafed with machine gun fire. Um, Germany, obviously, is going to be supplying a lot of this. And like I said, it's like a trial run for Hitler. Um, it's going to happen a couple of years later, the Blitzkrieg. So that's the end of the post-impressionist work. If you